Hello and welcome. I'm Alex Grodnick, and this is Moving Up, a podcast about secrets to success, struggles along the way, and life in general. Today on the pod, Gil Beta from Comcast Ventures. On the pod, Gil shares what he thinks is the key to all of his success, and we go deep into his pretty amazing journey. Gil, thanks so much for being on the pod. Alex, thanks for inviting me. Looks like uh, we're going to have a good time today. Yeah, I mean, we've already been bantering, going back and forth here. It's always like we have such a good conversation. I'm like, oh, no, don't say anything more. Let me let me hit the red button first. Right. I'll try not to say, oh, like we said before. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's usually how it goes. The listeners love that. Um, so uh, Comcast Ventures, Genicast Ventures. Um, we'll get into all your uh, venture capital stuff you got going on today. But like whenever I meet with a venture capitalist, I haven't met with one yet that said, oh, I knew I wanted to be a VC when I was a kid. Do you, right. do you is that? I, is that, did, I, I did not. Um, I have a technical background, so I love computers, program computers way back in, in high school and college. So I studied computer science and uh, d- decided that you know, I wanted to program computers. And so the first 10 years of my career was all about um, being a software engineer for uh, companies large and small. I helped develop uh, part of the Unix operating system, so something you know, you know, really down and dirty, and, and then also um, develop application, financial branch automation application. So did, did the full stack. Um, then I I founded uh, my first company, which was an ad tech company, and uh, I was the founder CTO. Uh, then that company exited, founded another company, and then after that second company. Um, I had an opportunity to go into venture. Mm. So uh, it was a series of accidents, decisions, but I've been in venture for 11 years now and, and having a great time. Right, so let's, let's stay in the early days here for, yeah. for, for a few questions at least. Um, where did this like inclination for technology, this entrepreneurship side of you, did that come from your parents? Were your parents entrepreneurs? Like, do you think you wanted to work for a big company yourself? Like, what, what is that inside of you that, that kind of pushed you that way? My parents were uh, the consummate entrepreneurs. Okay, yeah. They, uh, neither of them had a, a college education. I'm not even sure whether they graduated high school, uh, but uh, so they started a number of businesses in, in, the, in the clothing uh, uh, industry um, where they would uh, sell clothing. Uh, they had stores and all. And I worked in those stores. And so I was, a, you know, at age of 8, 9, 10, 11, working in these stores selling women's clothing. Uh, and uh, they were very entrepreneurial. They grew their business. From, from one store to many stores. Uh, and so it was always in my blood. And all during high school and college, I was starting a bunch of businesses. And of course, mo- most of them failed, uh, but was always thinking about, uh, about problems that needed to be solved, about opportunities, markets. Uh, and you know, I remember back in my early days, I used to keep a list of, of ideas of companies that, that I would start, and which, I, which I advise every entrepreneur to do, is just keep, keep a running list of, of, of ideas and keep right, reprioritizing them. Which ones do you think are you know, less possible now or more possible? Which ones are you more or less excited about? Uh, and funny, uh, a while back, I, I looked back at that list, and this list was from the 80s. And uh, there are some ideas on there that I actually think are still good ideas today. <clears throat> and I challenge some of your, your listeners maybe to, uh, uh, to do one of these businesses. So one of them was, I don't even know if it's possible, but it's popcorn that pops in the shape of an animal. So like animal crackers for popcorn. And so the margins on Popcorn are probably, I don't know, nickel or dime, but wouldn't you pay extra if the popcorn was in the shape of a zebra or an elephant or a lion or something? So that was one of my early ones. Some of them are crazy, some of them not so crazy uh, and, and, and all. Um, but I always knew that I was going to, uh, uh, to, to start a business. Um, uh, and uh, so I was just you know, waiting for the right idea. But I mean, 
you know, I love hearing about this because thinking of business ideas, starting businesses, it all requires practice. It's not like you just have some light bulb moment and it's like, oh, I didn't think of any businesses. Now I thought of my very first one and this is gonna be the one I'm gonna go do and it's gonna be great. It's like, it's a muscle that requires uh, like use. Yeah, uh, it, you put it perfectly, Alex, that you have to be practicing. You have to be, an entrepreneur is not just somebody who starts a company. It is somebody who is constantly continuously in that process of starting a company. And then one of them actually sticks and you end up doing that for many years. It's also feeling pain points and problems. Maybe you could just, maybe it's easier to start off if you don't have the list, you've never thought of a business, just to think of problems that, that you see, you know, it takes a long time to drive to the airport or wait in line with security or, you know, whatever it is, write down problems yeah. and then you can try to like think of business solutions to those problems. Well, maybe some don't have a solution, maybe, maybe some do. I, I think it's, uh, there's a, a parallel, though in opposite universes, between an entrepreneur and a comedian. A comedian goes through life making all these observations of, oh, like, you know, uh, waiting at the airport or whatever, and they turn it into a joke or some right. sort of life experience. And an entrepreneur makes those same observations, yeah. but instead of trying to make it funny, they actually try to solve that problem. Oh, I like that a lot. That's great. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, okay, so you're this entrepreneurial kid growing up, starting stuff left and right. Uh, you, you, you go to college, right? Yes. Where do you go to college? Cal State Northridge. Cal State Northridge. Northridge. California. Yeah, yeah, that's where my business partners went to. Went oh, to great. So are you, yeah. are you from LA? I am from LA. Yeah. Okay, and the clothing store was in LA? Yes. Oh, what, what part of LA? Uh, the clothing store was actually in Inglewood. Uh -huh. um, we lived in LA proper and then eventually moved to Beverly Hills. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, okay, so so you, so you, you, you go to CSUN and when you're there, you still, you, you still have this like entrepreneurial passion because like I was like you, I was starting businesses left and right growing up and then I went to school and uh, like I guess I went to Lehigh in Pennsylvania and now it's like everyone's like, oh, I want to be an investment banker or an accountant or a consultant and I'm like, oh, there's like these prestigious jobs that like their society is telling me that I should go get. I, can, I mean, that was my path, but in hindsight, I was like, well, I shouldn't have done that. I should have just gone and like continued starting businesses and sure. maybe I would have owned the biggest dirt farm by now or something. But um, you get caught up kind of in like what all your friends are doing. Did that happen to you? I was, um, don't let any of my kids hear this, but I was not focused on school at all. School to me was something that I knew I had to do that I knew would look good on my resume. Uh, but it's it, you know unless it was fun and interesting, I wasn't super engaged. So during high school, where I, I founded one of my first companies called Mind Games, which was um, a video game for the original Apple II computer. Mm -hmm. So I would spend uh, days and nights and uh, programming uh, the game and maybe showed up for class, maybe didn't. And so in high school, my grades were marginal. Maybe I had a C or a C plus average. Uh, I think in college, maybe I upped it to a B or a B minus. Uh, but I knew that the grades, that, that was not gonna be my ticket. Um, and I have a lot of respect for those folks who are focused on maximizing their their university experience and I think that's that's super important for me it just didn't click and so even during high school and and college I was I was starting companies um, and probably my grade suffered well it's I mean I, I think it's a good uh, testament to you that you were able to realize that School's not what I want to be focusing on. I want to be focusing on these other things because, like, I kind of feel like I was similar to you. I didn't want to focus on school, but I did it anyways because, like, yeah. people pressures. It's like, oh, you need to do this, and you're right. I should have just been. I mean, not should have. I mean, that was my path, and and so and so sure. So I'm actually kind of envious of you that you had that self awareness to say, yeah, this is not not what I want to be focusing. Nobody on. Nobody has ever asked me what my GPA was. Yeah, no one. No one. Unless knows. you're like in the top, you know, cum laude. Um, and, and you know, nobody asks you what, uh, you know, I don't think anybody's, I volunteered it because I'm a little bit proud that I actually, you know, did not get A's and B's, that I'm actually a C student and was able to do quite well. Um, and so for all those people out there who 
maybe are, are focused on other things or school isn't their forte, um, there's still lots of opportunity yeah. for those people. They're very cool, Gil. Okay, so I wanna, at the end of this, we'll get into like, how you think you were successful despite you know the grades or whatever but yeah. um okay so you're starting these um, uh, uh, video games for the apple computer yeah. and uh, did that turn into a business it did turn into a business and we sold i think 500 or 700 copies of the game uh, we actually got an offer to be acquired which we should have taken it wouldn't have been a great outcome but it would have been a great opportunity to uh, uh, you know, to work with a larger company, uh, but we thought we could do it ourselves. We thought we could do everything, and so we decided to go to go it our, our, ourselves. And um, uh, and we never came out with a second game. My my partner and I didn't actually work out between us, and we went our separate ways. And uh, and that was that. That was that. Yeah. So then, what was next for you? Uh, I moved to Hong Kong. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, after I uh, finished college, I was doing my MBA at Cal State North as well. Just like back to back? You know, yeah, back because I thought, oh, I got, you know, I want to get it going to business. I think I should have an MBA. Uh, um, and of course, the content would be interesting to, to learn the business side of it. I knew the technical side of it. Uh, and I got an offer to uh, to work in Hong Kong for Hong Kong Shanghai Bank on their financial branch automation uh, next gen solution. So moved to Hong Kong, uh, spent about a year there uh, launching their their new branch uh, systems, and um, had an amazing time. Uh, it was a great time. To, that was, I think, 1988, so before the handover, uh, around Tiananmen Square time, and um, that was just awesome. Yeah. Wow, it's pretty cool. How'd you, I mean, did that, how did you get that job? I made myself available. I uh, I was doing consulting at the time for Unisys, and they were they got this contract to do Hong Kong Shanghai Bank's new system. And I said, I'll go, I'll do it. And that was it. And wow. so like the next month I was there. Then I came back uh, uh, for a couple of weeks for my sister's wedding, proposed to my wife. And then a month later, my fiance, now wife, uh, came to Hong Kong and we lived there together. Wait, so she was in what LA, LA while you were in Hong Kong? Yeah. And then you came back and you were dating before you moved to Hong Kong? Yeah. So you're doing long distance LA to yep. Hong Kong. And it's a pretty, <laughs> pretty long one. And she quit her job uh -huh. and moved there. We had an awesome time there. Came back in 89, got married. Um, and uh, a year later, had our first child and kept going. Congrats. And so you came back and you were living in LA? Yes. And you have your, your first kid there. And were you still working in like the same kind of Company. I was doing consulting at that time for Teradata and IBM. So just as a side note, um, I've never had, up until actually working for Comcast Ventures uh, two or three years ago, I never worked for anybody as an employee except for one of my own companies. So when I was working in Hong Kong, when I was you know, uh, working with IBM and Teradata and all these other companies, I was always consulting. So they could fire me at any time. Uh, I was always looking for my next opportunity. I would be there for maybe a year or two and then move on to, to another consulting assignment. So I, I was always a consultant. Right. So, I mean, the, the thing of the consultant is like, they're looking for you to provide value from, from day one. Right. So what is it that they saw in you that were like, oh, Gil, you can provide us with X? It was the technical talent. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the fact that I was able to uh, develop real low level code, operating system level code, and all the way up to application level code. Um, and I was available and you know, this is sort of the theme that that you'll see um, sort of intertwined throughout my experiences. Um, I've I've be, always been a risk taker. Um, I've always kept myself available and open for taking risk. So whether it is 
you know, potentially risking my education with bad grades for a startup, whether it's uh, doing consulting and where I could be you know, fired at any moment, but it was an interesting job, interesting opportunity, whether it's taking the risk to you know, moving 5,000 miles away to Hong Kong uh, and, and living there, not ever having been to Hong Kong. Um, and again, I could be you know, fired the next day and have to move back. So you know, there was a you know, constant ingredient in my career, which is the willingness to, to take risks. Yeah, which is the hallmark of an entrepreneur, basically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you're back in LA, you're starting a family, you're consulting still. Um, how's life going at this point? Are you, are you pretty it, happy? Great. Yeah. Awesome. Living in Studio City, California, uh -huh. um, have a second child, and uh, still doing consulting. And then I was introduced to um, uh, what would be my, my co-founder, uh, Dave Morgan. Uh, he was introduced to me by uh, Brad Burnham of Union Square Ventures. Back then he was with uh, AT&T Ventures. And we sort of brainstormed an idea around um, creating, so this is the, the premise of my first company, creating uh, customized, targeted news content for uh, people on the internet. Uh, this was the uh, mid-90s when folks were just beginning to adopt the internet. And we had an idea that a website would learn your preferences and your tastes and deliver you news that was interesting to you. And we said, okay, wow, that's a, that's a, that's a great idea. At least we thought it was a great idea. Yeah. How are we gonna make money? Mark Zuckerberg thought it was a pretty good idea too. There you go. And so, so we, we went through like, what are the potential business models? So subscription model, or we could license the system, or we could do this thing called advertising. And we kept coming back to the advertising model. And it was at that point we thought, you know what? Other folks in the internet are going to need the same revenue model. So why don't we start an advertising company? So even before we launched, we pivoted the company yeah. from a personalized news company to an online advertising company. And that's how Real Media was born. Uh, I mean, this is very common, especially in, in FinTech as well. You're going out to solve some consumer problem along the way, you're like, oh, this is why is it so difficult to do X? Yeah. Let's pivot to go solve the problem for enterprise. Right, yep. So, okay, so you, you, you want to solve this problem to make it easier to, to advertise on, on content websites. So, so that was the, the point where, so my, my co-founder was from the Philadelphia area. I was in Los Angeles, had a home, wife, two small kids, and um, uh, we decided that, you know, if we're going to start the company, we both we have to be in the same place. So it was that time I said, honey, pack the kids. We're moving to Fort Washington, Pennsylvania, which is in the suburbs of Philadelphia. Right. Uh, these were the go-go 90s of the internet. And I said, don't worry, we'll be there for a year or two. We'll sell the company and then we'll move back. And uh, it's been over 20 years and we're still there. So we we uh, uh, we moved there and uh, had two more kids. So I have uh, four. We built Real Media and um, exited to a, uh, a public company in uh, 2001. Uh, and then soon thereafter, my partner and I got together and started another company called Dakota, which is in the behavioral advertising space, or in the, in the target data space. Mm, interesting. Uh, you're the, the second podcast in a row where you, the co-founders have gone on to start one successful company and then it's like, okay, let's just go replicate this and we like, we're a good team, let's go do this again. Yeah. Is, is, that, is that common? You know, I'm not sure it's common. It, it's, a, it's a very difficult relationship. I think Dave and I, my co-founder Dave Morgan and I, had the advantage of not being friends before. Mm. I think if you're friends, you have uh, some expectation of each other, you have a pre-existing relationship, and um, uh, 
sometimes you, you, you not knowingly, but might tap into or take advantage of that, of that friendship or that pre-existing uh, relationship. Uh, we weren't, and so first and foremost, we were business partners. The business came first. We developed a friendship along the way. Sure. Uh, but uh, our primary concern was you know, making sure that we were doing the right thing for the business. Right. We became so close that when it came time for the second company, we had this familiarity, we had this playbook, we knew what each of us were good at or not good at, and so really able to um, like get through those early years um, that, that we had at our previous company of just sort of figuring out who we each were. Um, sort of those honeymoon years and, and, and really get, get, get down to business. Now, and did you keep this, the same roles from company to company? We did. Yeah, he was the CEO and I was the CTO. Okay, and so yeah. that, you said let's And go, that works well. Let's go do it yeah. again, yeah. And, and Dakota did well. Uh, we, it was not without its ups and downs as every startup is. Uh, where you don't hear about these stories, but there isn't a startup that I've been involved with, either personally or as an investor, that doesn't have that sort of cliffhanging moment. Yeah, no, you only hear about two guys in a garage, overnight success, no yeah. There like, you go, billionaire. <laughs> so, so Dakota uh, was acquired by AOL in 07, and that's when I had a decision to make on, okay, what do I want to do next? Mm -hmm. And what was your thought process there? I've done two startups. I've done, I've done two startups, uh, been there, done that, loved the experience. Uh, they turned out well. I wanted to be involved with startups, but didn't necessarily feel like I needed to start another company. Um, my co-founder, Dave, uh, is a glutton for punishment. He actually started a third company that's doing very well. Uh, but uh, I, wanted to, I, I wanted to stay involved but in startups. Didn't want to be a, a founder. Uh, felt like I had something to contribute to, to new startups. Didn't just want to be an, in, uh, uh, an advisor or a board member or consultant to the companies. Wanted to, um, uh, wanted to take the ride with the founders and found the best role would be as an investor. Right. Uh, and again, talking about taking risk, I wanted to be sort of in a risk position with these companies so that they knew that I had something um, at stake, something to risk, some skin in the game, uh, and not just the, uh, the founders. So I, um, just before AOL, uh, AOL acquired Dakota, in addition to being CTO, I was uh, head of corp dev, ran our fundraising process, which turned into the acquisition by AOL. During the fundraising process, that's when I met uh, the Comcast Ventures folks. At the time, in 2007, 2008 timeframe, they weren't doing any seed investment. So we decided to form a fund together called Genicast, uh, where we would both contributed capital. So Comcast was an investor and I was personally an investor in the fund uh, to invest in early stage, seed stage, B2B tech companies in the Northeast. Um, and that's what I'm doing now. But also a few years ago, I joined the main fund, Comcast Ventures, to do Series A and beyond investments. Hmm. So I guess the obvious question here is, you've never worked for anyone. Why not just start your own fund? Why go work for, why go work for one? Yeah, uh, Genicast was my I, own fund. You're right. I, I was a partner there, right. so right. I wasn't yet an employee. Yeah. So I st the only two companies that I was ever an employee were, were Real Media and Dakota, uh, my companies. Before that, I was a consultant yeah. working for myself. Uh, or an unpaid labor for your parents. There you go, absolutely. Uh, uh, but when the opportunity a few years ago came uh, to join Comcast Ventures, I thought that was, a, that was a new challenge. I had been investing at that time eight or nine years in seed stage companies at my fund, Genicast, uh, which was a great experience. And I wanted to learn something new, wanted to give something, something else a try. And so in addition to doing that, I wanted to do later stage investing. Mm -hmm. and, and so um, I thought it was a great opportunity uh, to uh, sort of hone my skills at sort of Series A and beyond. 
Sure. And is there, I mean, like just the comparing and contrasting here, like being on your own versus going to work for a company that's or a firm fund that's established doing this is a, plug yourself in and start to just learn from people that, that know a lot about what they're doing. Yes. Right. I, I, th I, th I think that the bulk of the learning uh, was really when I was doing Genicast. Uh, when I uh, started Genicast and went to do my first deals, I had been on the, as an entrepreneur, I had been on the other side, on the ones who were pitching and asking for investment. And not, now I was on the other side of the table. And it's, it's, a, it's a different skill set. Uh, I think I empathized with the entrepreneurs because I was once on their side of the table. Uh, but, and I had te a tech background. I also had a business background. I ran a number of the business units uh, at Real Media um, and Dakota. So I had, you know, the sales marketing experience as well. But in the venture business, you have to be sort of a jack of all trades. You have to understand every aspect of the business in, able to, in, in order to be able to uh, understand the risk that you're taking. And you know, venture capital is not about avoiding risk. It's about understanding risk and taking risk. Understanding this business, you know, where are the vulnerabilities? Uh, so I had to you know, hone my skills on go to market and sales and marketing. And you know, I had them on, on tech, but certainly I was investing in companies where the tech eventually was you know, way beyond me and in, in, in sectors that, that I had, had uh, you know, nothing to do with. So um, I, I really learned from the Comcast Ventures guys about how to do venture. Yeah. And then also you learn a lot by actually writing checks. And you know, a lot of folks think that we're in the investment business but we're actually in the divestment business. It's, it's easy to write that check. Right. It's difficult to get an exit and have somebody else write you a check to pay back your LPs. Sure. Um, okay, so I'll get you out of here on, on this last one here. Sure. So we talked about that, like society says you gotta get good grades. Obviously there's you know, infinite paths yeah. in life. What do you think has been you know, your differentiating factor? Like what's set you apart and as you said, uh, enabled you to be, you know, have a pretty successful career and you know, translate it to like, you know, what you would tell your kids about you know, kind of just imparting this, this advice? I think it would be to be open-minded. To be open-minded about opportunities. Uh, some opportunities come to you because you seek them out. Other times they just present themselves. And, and I think you need to, uh, especially early on in your career, be a little bit more adventurous or risk-taking um, uh, because you never know where life will take you. What You, you may think that um, uh, you would be best for one path or another or you have a certain interest in, in one industry or sector or another, but as you said, there are infinite number of opportunities out there. Um, there's only so much that planning can get you. You can certainly prepare yourself um, by maybe getting good grades or experimenting with, with uh, startups or, or what have you. But I think being open-minded and being uh, put your, putting yourself in a position and a mindset to, uh, to be able to take risk. And I, and I would credit um, my wife who um, was really supportive through all of this while I was doing consulting and when we lived in Hong Kong and I didn't even mention that when we had two small kids we lived in Belgium for, for a year when I was consulting assignment there and then we moved to you know to Pennsylvania uh, and had two more kids right. and all while I was you know, doing all these startups uh, she was uh, very supportive and 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 really took that ride, enabled me to take that, labeled, enabled us to take that ride. Um, and we always knew that what's the worst that, that could happen? We would you know, sell the house and move into an apartment and, uh, and I'd get another job. And once you can accept the, the downside scenario and it's not so bad, then it really frees you up to, to, to take risk and seek opportunities. Yeah, I love that advice. And 
kudos to you for finding such a cool wife. That, that sounds that sounds great. But you know, really, just thanks so much for coming on here, sharing your story. This was very enjoyable speaking with you. With pleasure, Alex. Anytime. Thank you. Thanks for listening today. If you like moving up, the best way you can support us is by telling your friends, helping us grow, and also leave a review on iTunes. Thanks.